Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, welcome. I guess we'll get started now that we're at the top of the hour, but welcome everyone to this ANFP Learning and Access to Finance Report Dissemination Webinar on the impact of customized financial support on small and medium sized enterprises. I will pass it along to Angela uh, to give some opening remarks. Great. Thanks, Vivian. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Mlaisho, and I'm the Chief of Party for the Alliance for Inclusive and Nutritious Food Processing Program, AINFP in short. This program is a partnership between USAID, Partners in Food Solutions, and TechnoServe, and it aims to create a more competitive food processing sector and in turn, increase the availability of safe, affordable and nutritious food. AINFP provides technical assistance to food processors in Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Tanzania and Zambia to address specific manufacturing and business challenges that hinder their growth. Access to finance continues to be a determining factor in the growth of the food processing sector and a key priority among the suite of interventions that the program provides. AINFP works with the Initiative for Smallholder Finance, ISF Advisors, a sub-partner of the program who supports SMEs in accessing finance that is required for, for their business growth. Under Access to Finance, the program offers support through business advisory in investment preparedness, and linkage to capital providers who vary from private equity, conventional lenders, impact investors, and challenge funds. In the last five and a half years, the AINFP program has tailored support to enhance the number of food processors accessing finance, and to date has facilitated the access of over 12 million US dollars in loans and grants, for food processors across the region. These efforts have resulted in multiple strategies, approaches, and lessons learned that have been presented in a report by ISF advisors. This report provides a comprehensive understanding of the impact that access to finance support has had on food processors on the AINFP program in the implementing countries. To share the findings, and extend the conversation across the sector. I am pleased to welcome you all to the learning webinar on the impact of customized financial support on some small and medium enterprises. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to my colleague from ISF Advisors, Vivian, who will take over the moderation of this particular webinar. Over to you, Vivian. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Angela, for the introduction. And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vivian Wu, and I'm an investment associate with ISF Advisors, and I will be facilitating today's panel. Um, and just some, as some background on ISF Advisors, we are a strategic and financial advisory group committed to mobilizing capital for a more sustainable, equitable, and profitable um, productive global food system. We help the public and private sector develop more practical, profitable, and sustainable financial solutions. Some examples of our work in the access to finance space include designing funds and facilities to mobilize funding, supporting financing intermediation, and providing strategic support and capital mobilization for high impact agricultural SMEs. For today's webinar, we're not only sharing insights from our latest report, but we're also bringing together access to finance experts and stakeholders from the food processing industry. Together, we'll delve into how access to finance support has been pivotal for SMEs in overcoming their financing barriers. Our panel will offer a deep dive into the challenges, opportunities, and solutions encountered by food processors in securing finance. We'll hear firsthand from those who have benefited from these interventions, alongside industry experts who will provide valuable insights on leveraging financing opportunities for SMEs in future programs. So whether you're a business seeking to navigate the complexities of securing finance, 
a finance provider looking to deepen your engagement with SMEs, or an industry stakeholder interested in the intersection of SME development and finance, this webinar will provide you with valuable insights and actionable strategies for empowering SMEs. Furthermore, by highlighting successes and lessons learned from the program, we aim to guide the design and implementation of future SME development programs. So thank you all for joining us today and for this discussion. And 10 minutes before the end of the session, we will also be opening it, opening it up to questions from the chat box. So please feel free to share your questions and your thoughts there throughout the session. I will pass it over to my colleague, Beatrice Now, the Access to Finance Manager in the NFB program to introduce herself and her involvement. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vivian, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Beatrice Gedeji, as mentioned by Vivian, and my background is agriculture finance, having worked with uh, commercial leaders and impact investment affairs across Sub-Saharan Africa. At AINFP, I led the access to finance activities, and this component of the program was introduced to complement the technical assistance provided by the food experts at TechnoServe and Partners in Food Solutions. And the activities around access to finance were aimed at supporting the food businesses within the program to access uh, the much needed finance for their growth, as well as also access business advisory uh, services uh, to support them. The component looked at both the demand side of uh, agri-finance, uh, and the initial activity was to conduct uh, an agri-MSME finance landscape assessment in each country. And this was to uh, for us to get a better understanding of both the demand and the supply side of agri-finance. And we looked at different aspects, like you know the structure of agri-MSMEs, uh, their needs, the challenges we're facing in accessing finance, the macroeconomic situations. We were also uh, in that assessment able to identify solutions uh, that existing new and upcoming agri uh, opportun uh, finance opportunities. Uh, and this cut across uh, the private equity fund, the impact investment fund, uh, and commercial banks, as well as also the microfinance uh, aspect. The other activity that we carried out uh, was then to identify the ANFP enterprises that had uh, indicated they had an access to finance need. Uh, and this was followed up by a preliminary assessment of each businesses. And as we quickly learned that an enterprise may think what they need is finance, uh, but what the, the immediate need is uh, other needs, like you know, putting uh, systems in place, such as uh, management uh, operational record keeping, proper data management, uh, having proper cost management mechanisms. We also learned that if an enterprise has loopholes, the priority for any advisor to the enterprise should be to seal those loopholes before injecting any new fats. Otherwise, then the new fats will just end up being absorbed into these loopholes. So, so, so that preliminary assessment advised us on what specific support to provide to each SME. So for those ones who are investment ready, we then supported them uh, be more investment uh, prepared to meet the investors' requirements. We also opened them up to available opportunities in their market. Some of them were existing, other opportunities were not known to these SMEs. Uh, so after they got financing, we later in the program introduced a new support component that is a post disbursement support. And we saw how critical this was, especially during the COVID uh, period where businesses were struggling to meet their own repayments. So we sort of acted as an intermediary between the, the financiers and the SMEs to support them negotiate on the structure terms uh, and reviewing some of the loan terms. On the supply side, having identified existing new funding and upcoming funding opportunities, we then selected uh, partners, uh, partner lenders, or these were very targeted uh, financial institutions that we worked with across the program. And, and this cut across uh, you know, the banks that we are known in the market. We also worked with impact investment funds and private equity funds. And this was not only important for our enterprises to access finance, but we then uh, actually learned along the way that the lenders were also a good source of uh, program uh, pipeline. We were able to support some of the businesses they were working with uh, to receive the technical assistance the program was providing. On the business advisory side, we had uh, that as a that component in the program, the demand side, supply side, and then we introduced an in-between the business advisory uh, services. And this we... Um, provided by uh, conducting access to finance trainings to the SMEs. These trainings had a very interesting dimension because we introduced the 
the pitch sessions and this brought in uh created a platform for our businesses to interact with our uh, investment uh lenders uh to their to their sector to learn new funding opportunities and it was very really important uh not only for them to access finance but for the lenders that we invited to, to get a better understanding of how our program worked we conducted uh, a very specific product uh, training in ethiopia and the product we targeted was warehouse receipt financing which was a new uh, product in the market and our clients were not aware of. So we brought in the financing institutions, the, you know, the warehouse managers, uh, the government institutions that were actually running with this, and IFC who was spearheading this activity in Ethiopia. That uh, supported our businesses to access financing under that uh, warehouse receipt uh, mechanism. So uh, speaking to the report, uh, as a result of this effort, we have been able to work uh, with a total of 103 enterprises uh, to sub provide them with the business advisory services. Uh, and then out of this, around 50% of them were able to access financing, which was over $13 million, as earlier mentioned by Angela, and with some transactions still going on. Uh, commercial financing accounted for 85% uh, of the total financing. We noted that, uh, you know, with an average size of a, a loan ticket size of $260,000 per, per, per client. The commercial banks uh, provided a uh, majority of this bulk financing at around 85%. And this was mainly driven because in some of the markets, like the Tanzanian market, the commercial banks had better uh, or better, better rates for their, their loans the, under the agribusiness uh, lending window. In a case like uh, in the Ethiopian market where lending is in local currency is restricted to banks. So our clients then worked with the commercial banks in those markets. The other uh, lender who significantly contributed into this pool were the impact investment funds, but they, they were not as much as we had anticipated. And this is because these investors will typically lead in hard currency, while our clients within ANFP uh, sell their products in the domestic markets, thus earning in local, uh, in local currency. Working capital uh, was the most demanded financing uh, mechanism or, or structure, and this was because uh, the businesses were seeking to procure raw materials during the harvesting seasons. We worked with food processing businesses, a lot of them were millers. Uh, private equity venture capital financing uh, continued to be uh, unfamiliar. They were still uh, also unfamiliar and not very appealing to the companies that we worked with. Uh, we worked with majorly because these businesses are family owned and the owners were wary of relinquishing their ownership and the control of these businesses. Uh, in the past, also private equity funds have targeted uh, bigger SMEs, but we noted a very interesting trend along the way where we, 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 select, we picked uh, a few private equity funds that were then targeting uh, smaller ticket sizes of an average of 50,000 per, per client. And what we did is that this observation in the market informed the training that we did uh, tweak the, our training to also open our businesses to, you know, understanding how it's private equity financing structured, uh, how can I position myself, even if not now, in future for this private equity financing. So those are the, the highlights of, of our training, uh, of, sorry, of the report. There's much more, especially on the nuances of the, the specifics of, uh, of the data. Uh, and at this point, I want to pause uh, and hand over the mic to the other panelists for a quick introduction. Great, thanks Beatrice. Why don't we start with um, Simon first and then we can go down the line. Yeah, thank you very much uh, and good afternoon everybody. My name is Simon Kinopia. I head uh, agribusiness segment at APSA Bank uh, Kenya, PLC. It's a pleasure to be on this uh, panel and looking forward uh, to more interactions. Thank you. Back to you, Vivian. Thanks, Simon, for the introduction. And next, um, how about Winnie from Whimsy Dairies? Would you like to go next? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Winnie Wandimi from Whimsy Limited. I'm the MD and founder of Whimsy Limited, which is a dairy company in Kenya. Thank you. Thanks, Winnie. And finally, for Kambukalani at Legacy Manufacturers. Hi everyone, my name is Kumbukilan Kiri. I'm the founder and director of Legacy Manufacturers Limited. Thank you. Great, thank you all the panelists for your introductions and a warm welcome to everyone. Um, 
We'll kick off our discussion first with Beatrice, um, who led the access to finance activities within the program. Could you please start by summarizing your findings on companies that successfully secured financing throughout the program? And following that, could you share your insights on the distinct characteristics of SMEs that you observed and how that impacted their ability to access finance? Uh, thank you, Vivian. I think it was interesting because we worked with uh, SMEs uh, across many value chains and uh, across the business life cycle. We had small, medium, and large. And, and our small uh, was probably not as small in some markets. Uh, but just to get to your first point on what it is that we observed among the ones who were able to access financing, most of the leaders, uh, especially the commercial leaders, were very keen to work with very growth-focused enterprises. And how this was assessed, we looked at the, the last couple of years uh, in, in uh, growth uh, revenues. Uh, the ones that had uh, recorded a significant growth, those ones were more attractive to the lenders, as well as also clients who had a good credit history. Uh, this was also very attractive to any, any lenders. And this cut across uh, grant uh, providers and commercial lenders. Uh, businesses that had some sort of uh, systems, be it management, operational systems, uh, had some form of uh, record keeping systems, even if it was an uh, Excel template, there was sort of uh, you know, some form of record keeping. We also noticed for commercial lenders, profitability was very key. They were very keen to work with uh, clients with net, uh, positive net margins uh, or positive uh, EBITDA. And, and just looking at the impact investors, in addition to the ones I've just highlighted, we, the, the, the impact of the business on the small scale farmers, uh, on the environmental uh, side of, 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 of things, and also inclusion of women and youth were key considerations for the impact investors. Uh, the commitment to the entrepreneur in this process, uh, in our activity, was very crucial in us, you know, fast tracking that and them being able to access financing. And, and we noted, uh, you know, going forward, even for future programs, just considering the eligibility criteria for lenders or for the grant providers that are targeted by the SMEs or, you know, that could benefit the SMEs is very critical at the onset of the program, at the design stage, so that either you, uh, you know, you're working with them to co-design a program or they're coming along the way uh, to help you at the initial stages of selecting and on onboarding SMEs. Uh, coming to... Um, the various categories of SMEs we worked with. The foundation of clients were clients uh, who had annual turnovers of less than $100,000 uh, per year. Uh, and these were small, most of them were pre revenue. They required a lot of hard holding uh, to meet their development non the developmental needs. And, and what we noted is that most of them, because they were not eligible to access uh, interest based financing, we supported them or they, they were more attractive or they, they attracted more of concessional capital and grant opportunities. Uh, and we worked with a lot of them uh, in some countries and, and they varied because in a country like Malawi, you have more of the, you know, the foundational, the micro SMEs uh, compared to a country like Kenya that has a bit more developed, more mature SMEs. When it comes to the medium ones uh, in our program and the medium ones were the businesses that were between $100,000 from one $1,000 to $500,000 annual turnovers, these ones would, wouldn't call them micro. They, a lot of them were you know, uh, making profits, they were generating revenue, they had some form of uh, basic uh, systems in place, and they, required, they typically required support to strengthen their position for obtaining you know, commercial financing. They also required um, to be informed of other you know, commercial financing that is available in the market. A lot of them only knew, you know, their go-to was financial banks, uh, sorry, the, the commercial banks. So we had an opportunity to open them up to other, you know, the impact investment side, the matching uh, funds, the, you know, the, the grant opportunities that were speaking to their needs. Uh, the other category, which was the third one, was the accelerator clients. And these were clients who, any client was above $501,000 annual turnover. Most of these businesses were profit making, they had bro uh, proper sy systems in place. They were able to also articulate their financing needs uh, and prepare the financing proposals. However, they needed support in negotiating final financing terms. They also, a lot of them were not aware of other funding opportunities besides commercial banks. Um, coming to, uh, and I think these characteristics are very important to inform you know, specific support needed uh, by the enterprises. Uh, the, the like the trainings we had in the program, 
we had training that uh, targeted the medium and large SMEs. But then for the micro SMEs, we had a training on financial literacy that was very specific to micro SMEs. Um, speaking of another important observation that we noted were the value chains. It, it was easier for clients in very well known, very well developed value chains in each country. They differed from country to country to access financing. Why? Because the leaders were aware of those financing, uh, those value chains, they understood them, they knew how to assess them, and they knew how to mitigate those risks. Looking at the unstructured uh, value chains, the conversations were harder. Why? Because the, business, the lenders were not very familiar with them. Uh, you know, how do you assess a value chain that you don't understand how it works? So, and, and we noticed some of these value chains like honey, aquaculture, groundnuts, the orange fresh sweet potatoes, the conversations on commercial financing were harder than, you know, value chains like Dayre in a lot of the countries, uh, maize in some of the countries. And what we noted is that for future programs, if you're working less structured value chains, it would be most ideal to support, uh, to, you know, to extend that support to the lending institutions that you're working with, to help them understand the value chain, how to assess the risk and mitigate them and structure financial solutions. And if there's data that can be assessed by the lenders also, it would also be important because then it helps them in, uh, make informed decisions. Um, I think I want to pause here, Vivian. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you, Beatrice. Um, that's that's very insightful to hear how all the SMEs that you worked with, you know, there were so many different and diverse types, different sizes, um, different different value chains, and and that really impacted um the type of access to finance support that was um delivered and they were able to benefit from. And um so so next we'll move um over to our next panelist. Simon from, from ABSA Bank. Um, and ABSA Bank was one of the finance providers who actually established a formal partnership with the ANFP program. Um, so Simon, could you outline the nature of this collaboration and highlight any insights and areas for improvement for future partnerships between SME development programs and financial institutions? Yeah, thank, thank you, Vivian, and, and thank you, Beatrice, for outlining those uh, points, which I, I totally, totally follow and agree with, because that's the same thing we're seeing. I think from an APSA perspective, we were among the first financial institutions to really yeah, come into this, and just a little bit of background uh, around APSA. So APSA has been in this market uh, for over 100 years, previously as Barclays uh, Bank, and uh, as APSA, which is a Pan-African bank, um, we're looking at really uh, supporting the agri uh, space and hence it's a key focus area for us as a bank. So currently we have 11% market share um, over the years and uh, we take a value chain approach looking at uh, all the key actors across the value chains and trying to support them politically, not only in finance, but also looking at what other transactional requirements and any other uh, needs that they may have. So we have uh, our strategies anchored on four pillars, uh, and this um, our access to information as one of the key pillars that we've seen as uh, one of the needs for any value chain actor. I think there's need for actionable information uh, that is timely and relevant. The other aspect we've seen is, uh, and it's a pillar for us, is access to mentorship and coaching, uh, where we expose uh, our clients to various opportunities and, and partners that we come across. And the other aspect is access to markets. Again, we're partnering with uh, various uh, you know, people to do that. And then of course, uh, access to sustainable finance, which is uh, properly uh, structured and um, you know, uh, appropriate for the businesses. So for us, ANFP provided a, a very good opportunity because it, it, there's a lot of synergy around um, you know, our access pillars and our strategy. And indeed, we saw um, the clients that did get into the program benefit uh, immensely uh, because most of the challenges, especially with clients that are on a growth phase, uh, would not only be financial needs. Uh, we've seen, I think the initial clients uh, were looking at really um, areas of technology developments. And I think they really found uh, the interactions with the ANFP technical team very, very insightful. And indeed, they were actually uh, did take further conversations to, to look at ways they can actually improve their operations and hence uh, better margins and growth. So for us as a financial institution, we were, you know, 
working that journey in the background, looking at various investment opportunities. And we did actually provide working capital enhancements and also asset based financing for any investments in the machinery uh, side. I think as we as we as we went along, there are obviously other aspects of uh, business modeling, uh, market uh, development, and and those those nuances. And th these are very very significant and very very important for any um, business and any agri business in this space, because um, without that form of support, and 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 indeed a commercial bank would be able to only uh, you know come into only to a certain extent. Um, hence the reason why this kind of partnership uh, we felt was quite quite beneficial uh, for us. I think in terms of what could be done, uh, you know, what areas of improvement as we go forward, I think would be early include men, in, you know, including the financial institutions early in the journey, so that we we understand. I think the first first days were spent for us trying to really understand what ANFP program is about and trying to see how we fit in. How we can actually look at um, you know collabor a collaborative effort that really is beneficial to both parties, and the other aspect is really carrying our clients on 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 the same journey because I think uh, the pipeline build uh, also took a bit of time just to try and you can imagine first trying to get the financial institution uh, up to speed and then now getting the clients up to speed around uh, this partnership. So I think if we if we do our future programs, it would be very Good if we could get in early, and and one of the ways I've seen that could work is if we collaboratively and jointly, uh, you know, put together roundtables for targeted uh, value chains and targeted uh, sectors. We can actually also refine the target customers very well because we know, um, for example, in our in in our in our books, the clients who would benefit uh, directly. And and if that conversation comes in early, I think it will be of great, great, great value. And I think we'll see a lot of um, um, you know uh, massive intervention um, and and uptick of these uh, particular programs. So I think as a bank, we really see the value and and looking forward to uh, future engagements that will really help us uh, support our customers. Because through supporting our customers is how as a bank we're able to also ensure that we play their part and the clients are also growing and ensuring they're addressing all, all areas of their businesses. Uh, back to you, Vivian. Great. Thank you so much, Simon, for sharing those insights and how um, this partnership really resulted in a mutually collaborative, um, mutually beneficial um, engagement between the program and APSA Bank. Um, and also for highlighting future opportunities for um, programs and other financial institutions and, and really that insight on engaging them early on. Um, so now we'll move over to our next panelist, Diana at PES Consulting, who actually just joined us. So she was not able to give us an introduction yet. And um, so, Diana, I'd like to pass it over to you first. You can give an introduction as we kind of already went through uh, the other panelists, and then um, I'll, I'll ask you the question. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience. Um, as Vivian has said, my name is Diana Kishaga. I am the founder and managing partner of Private Equity Support. What we are is an enterprise support organization um, that has been working across sub-Saharan Africa with about uh, SMEs uh, from about 26 countries so far. And we are very happy to have had the opportunity to work with partners across the various aspects of the agricultural value chain, right from the production um, to people who work with aggregators, value production, um, all the way to people who actually do exports. So we're excited to be th with this panel, um, specifically because of the AINFP program, which I think um, we tend to focus on the benefits we're giving the SMEs, but sometimes we forget to mention that the SMEs also teach us quite a number of things. And I'm hoping I can do justice to some of the things we learned from the SMEs. I can see Winnie. I don't know how official it is because I've waved at her, but yes, I feel right at home when I see her on the screen on that side. So that's us in a nutshell. Thanks, Diana, for the introduction. Uh, and so the question we have for you that really um, kind of builds on that is that you, you led dedicated access to finance training sessions for these SMEs. 
Um, yes. Can you share kind of your experiences with these sessions, the types of support provided and found necessary, and also some insights, like you said, on what you learned from these SMEs? Yes. Um, so the first thing I really wanted to note was when we think about access to finance, often people tend to think of it as an external aspect uh, where Simon and his colleagues would be coming in. But we forget to understand that SMEs, as they continue to develop, as they continue to innovate, they're actually putting in some of their own retained funding into some of this product. So they're usually the port of call, the first port of call to finance some of the aspects internally, and they do this on a continuous basis. So when we start thinking about investor readiness, and this is something that we did with ANFP, was to really get the SMEs to think about, are we running our businesses in a way that is objective? It's not about passion projects. It's about what the business needs at a particular point of view. So our investment readiness always starts with an inside looking out mechanism get the entrepreneurs, the founders to really understand how is it that they need to structure support, right? Because it's not just the access to finance in terms of capital. Access to finance is even in terms of access to markets, uh, access to networks, networks that will enable you to get to certain markets. Do you have the right human resource for the next level at which you need to operate? Do you have the right sort of certifications that are needed? So it's really a holistic internal view because by the time you're going out to an external funder, what they're looking at is, if I'm gonna put in money, you need to have checked all these boxes. So that is how we had actually structured the training. Um, the second thing that I liked about ANFP was the freedom to be customized, right? What Whimsy is and what another farm is are totally different. So it's not about applying uh, the same cookie cutter approach to all. It's saying these are the basic things that we need to understand and we need the SMEs to understand after engagement. But how Whimsy will interpret this versus how a different company in a different value chain will interpret some of those things and even apply them is something that not many products uh, programs provide for. So I think for us, what uh, really helped was that as much as we were doing the in-person support and the review, especially of the investor-facing documents, and even to an extent for some of the companies, the financial statements, was the ability to understand within that particular value chain that this particular SME was um, operating, how well were they structured to go to the next level, especially with regards to receiving all the external finance. And I think we were fortunate enough to have a very active group of um, entrepreneurs who really took us to task. You know, it's not engagement of we say and they do. No, it's a thing of push back and forth and say, yes, that might work in theory, but what does that have? How does that work in a practical sense? And I think that's what we really liked about this uh, particular um, uh, engagement. I think the other thing that was very critical about the ANFP program is the issue about food quality, nutritious value within food. Um, I think a lot of funding that goes into these businesses yeah. does not necessarily focus on what we call the long-term value adds, right? It's okay to find someone to export. It's okay to find someone to come up with a new product. Mm -hmm. But what essentially will distinguish one company from another is things that are inherent to the food value chain. What's the nutritive value of a particular aspect? How are you ensuring that your customers are getting the best, you know, of the, the best possible product uh, from this particular food processors? And understanding that this, the costing, of, or rather the funding of those what we call the non-direct or non-immediate benefits is something that most funders will say, okay, I, I need to understand how if you do this method, which costs you more, yet your market is not willing to maybe pay a premium for it sometimes, how that is going to help you set up uh, to be able to grow into a larger company. So that particular aspect in terms of how we engage with the investor readiness was focusing on A, internally the company understanding where it needs to go and the growth path, two, understanding um, how these companies can demonstrate or show the long-term viability of funding aspects that most people in nutrition don't look at, certification, high nutritive value, yet the market is might not necessarily at that point 
be willing to pay a premium for it. But as we've seen and as the markets develop, this is something that future markets are happy to engage in. So I think for us, that was uh, what or how we structured our particular engagement with the companies. And the third and the fourth thing rather is something I believe Simon had also alluded to. How do we bring in the financiers early on into the process? So what we did is over the training session, uh, we had two types of engagements with the potential financiers. And when we talk about financiers, we were not just thinking about people providing um, debt like the banks. We're also thinking about people providing private debt, people providing equity or impact funding. Um, so it was really getting the companies to understand at each particular point, how do we fund those specific, uh, specific elements? So the financiers would come in into our sessions, explain what it is they're looking for, explain what exactly it is that they would like to see from the companies, but they also got an opportunity to hear from the SMEs who would tell them, I know you want this, but the reality is this is where we are. So how do we connect? So that interaction early on really helped. And then of course we had sessions where each business had an opportunity to present themselves across a panel of um, uh, these financiers or investors. And that really helped, right? Because if you already know what someone is looking for, you're able to tell to what extent do I fit in with this requirement? And then you can actually tailor what it is that you want to fund to suit that particular need that that financier might be interested in. So it's not about fibbing or exaggerating or pandering to the public. It's about saying, yes, my growth can be funded this way. You are likely to take me from point A to B, but from point B to C, I am likely to need someone else to come in and help. So I'd say that that was the interesting thing. Um, what we learned from this entrepreneurs, resilience. I honestly, um, that is not something you can teach. It is something they learned and it's something that they keep doing, especially in the changing macroeconomic environment uh, with changing regulations in terms of what is required for food. I and my team learned a lot because they were able to show us practically how they are able to navigate such um, circumstances or such environments. So I think that's one thing we can always learn from the entrepreneurs, their ability to navigate and be resilient, you know, without necessarily losing the, uh, you know, the focus on how they want to grow. The second thing is really to understand, especially for the women founders, and I might be a bit biased, but it's very interesting to understand that when they start their businesses, um, they often tend to start with lesser capital, right? Um, especially if someone is moving from what we call the professional careers, and then you say you want to go into dairy, you know, there's an issue of people thinking, ah, it's a hobby, um, you know? So dealing with institutional and cultural biases um, and learning how to navigate this, especially from the SMEs, what they have done. There's a lovely exercise we normally do um, on a case study where people get to choose um, a sort of like a hooded buck. And I think some of those lessons um, are what we, we really learn from the entrepreneurs. So I think in summary, I guess that is what I'd, I'd say. Great, thank you Diana. For sharing all those really valuable insights that you took away from those training sessions and interacting with the SMEs. And I think it actually now makes sense to move over to directly hearing from some food processors that we have on the panel. Um, and, and we have Winnie and Kambukalani, um, who were both participants in the ANFP program, um, and specifically in receiving this access to finance support. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this question is really for both of you. Um, and I guess Winnie, you can go first. Um, could you explain how this assistance, this access to finance um, support helped you in securing finance and also fostering your company's growth? Hi everyone. So as I said earlier, my name is Winnie. So I was also a participant in the INFP and uh, I have walked a journey with them because I think I have done quite a number of programs with them and uh, we have worked together. As Beatrice said at the beginning, uh, when they, we started the engagement, we were also not uh, very well structured. So we have walked a journey where we've been able to structure our business, 
to be ready for invest investors, just becoming investor ready. So in that work, we were able to come up with a board uh, which has worked with us uh, uh, all through. And then we were also able to do a strategic plan, which has also helped us walk this journey and a business plan, which is our guide in every day that whatever we do. After that, we were also able to have a net margin uh, analysis, which they, they, they were, we were able to see what was not giving us uh, margins and what was giving us margin and how we could tweak whatever we were doing so that we become profitable, as well as also serve our smallholder farmers and make them also economically empowered. So for uh, INFP, it has been a journey. And uh, so we have done quite a number of things together. In the program that uh, Diana is also talking about, we were also able now to learn how to pitch. Before we were getting investor ready, and now we came to pitching, which we were able to, to, to know how we go about it, how do we do it. And with that, we have managed to get some funding. We have managed to get the debt funding through NFP, and uh, we have also managed to get grants. So initially, we didn't even know that there were grants that existed. So we learned that. So we only knew that about debt. And uh, so far, we are working with USADF, which has funded us. And uh, we, we, are, we have been moving very well. Secondly, our farmers now have been able to, we have a project that we are doing of the long life machine, which we, as you know, milk is very, very perishable. We've had um, a machine that only does a two day life uh, milk. So with that, now we are coming up with a long life machine that will add our product to 180 days. So it can stay in the shelf for 80 days. So that's what now we are, we are, we are raising funds with and they are still working with us. And I'm so sure that even that project, we are going to come and do it and finish it. So it has been a journey and a very sweet journey and uh, we are learning a lot and we are still working together. So I thank you. Thank you so much, Winnie, for sharing your experiences uh, participating in the program and really congratulations to you also and your success um, throughout the program. And, um, and likewise, kind of the same question for you, Kambukalani, at Legacy Manufacturers. Um, could you explain kind of how the assistance helped you in securing financing and also fostering your company's growth? Uh, thank you very much, Vivian. Um, I think when we uh, became part of the program as Legacy, uh, it was at the time when we had just ventured into food processing. So we literally had no experience whatsoever in what we were doing. And personally, I had a background of civil engineering, working in construction industry. So I was used to running other businesses and not the food processing. So uh, since this was a diversification program for us, maybe we did not do our homework so well. So uh, two things happened when we just came into this industry. That was around 2019. Firstly, uh, when our equipment came from uh, abroad where we had bought it, uh, COVID came. So we could not manage to actually commission most of the equipment that we had procured from outside because engineers could not travel. And secondly, we could not raise the working capital that we needed to start running because we initially depended on an, our other business, which was construction to fund our operations. So we hit rock bottom right from the beginning. Um, it was at this time when, you know, uh, we couldn't see the future of what we wanted to do. Um, when we landed into the hands of uh, Technosave, who directed us to INFP. Uh, and that's how, you know, the relationship started. So they started from the first things first. They started by helping us work on the uh, product formulations. So they brought in experts from all over the world who helped us in terms of uh, product formulations. And we did manage to formulate more than six products with the support of the program. And once we were done with that, they came in and started providing us uh, support in terms of 
um, uh, raising uh, financing. And, you know, um, we managed to raise some grants through the program, which was very rare because we were too new. We had no, uh, we were not making any profits and our operations were just in disarray, so to say. So the program actually helped us in terms of um, putting um, uh, structures in place, um, you know, uh, putting our, prog our, our products, you know, into the market. They helped us with information on, um, uh, you know, how to reach the market, how to promote our products and such kind of things. Um, I'm, I'm happy to actually uh, announce that from the time that we started working with the program, that was, uh, late 2020 up to now, uh, the company has managed to move from an annual turnover of around $300,000 to over $2 million at the moment. And uh, we've managed to increase the workforce from just around 20 to 160 uh, members of staff at the moment. And in terms of uh, working with the farmers, we've moved from working with around 100 farmers to over 2,600 farmers at the moment. So to us, the program has really been so successful and I really don't know what could have been of legacy had it not been for the program. Basically that is in an act yeah. Great, thank you, Kofi Filani. And that's, that's very impressive how much your company has really been able to launch um, and get off the ground um, through the support of the NFP program and through the support of Access to Finance. Um, and I know that we are kind of getting close to the hour and we only have 10 minutes left. So I will first open it up to um, questions that we have in the chat box. And then if we have any remaining time, we can wrap up any other questions that we had prepared, but I will prioritize first the chat box questions. And I think we have one question from David and um, feel free anyone in the panel to answer this. What were your experiences with startups? Did they manage to get any funding? And if yes, what did funders look into and consider? What was the range of funding amounts and in which regions? Um, I, I, I can take this. Uh, thank you, Vivian. It, we did work with uh, uh, some startups and actually just uh, recapping on uh, Mr. Kubukilani, that was one of the businesses that was very new. Uh, it, it was a diversification for, for the, for the uh, enterprise, but the food uh, business was very new, Was they were starting up and we did manage to work with them. So our experience with startups uh, in, in the past hadn't been as positive as it was with uh, Mr. Kubukilani in that we managed to support him raise some grant funding that was then required to you know gain himself some some ground footing for him to uh, for the business to take uh, to take off in, in our other experiences in other markets the startups that we worked with that had been able to uh, access financing uh, and what i will say about startups and financing is that because they are pre-revenue it's highly advisable that they, they you know they're supported to access very concessional or uh, capital or, or grant financing why because it's very expensive for you to start a business with uh, interest-based financing. If the business doesn't pick up, then you start getting to a lot of problems. Uh, most of the collateral require uh, the, the, the business, uh, the funders require a lot of collateral that the early businesses don't have. We've also worked with businesses in at the early stages, access uh, venture capital financing, and this financing are. Uh, all of them are below $50,000 equivalent, the ones that we have managed to support. We've seen the experience with setups as a, if, if the owner is not well uh, supported, had held, they, they, they struggle a lot. They struggle a lot to get their footing, to get a uh, proper market. So, so that is why the, the capital required on that side is really, uh, is really patient. So that has been our experience with them. We've worked with some that worked. Uh, example is uh, Mr. Kubukilani's enterprise. We've worked with other enterprises that are still struggling to uh, gain the, 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 the crowd. We've worked with uh, startups that actually didn't pick. Uh, and as a program, we actually were very intentional in working with businesses that have been in operation for a minimum of two years. We've seen some of them uh, taking off, others just, just you know, struggling to take off. And there are very many dynamics, uh, very many markets. Uh, but on financing, as uh, my advice would be, if you're working with startups, 
support them to get a very uh, patient capital if they are venture capitals like the venture capital for africa platform has venture capitalists who are seeking for funding opportunities in africa that could be a good starting point uh, a lot of them with small grant uh, funding they are able to take off over to you vivian great thank you so much beatrice um, and then the next question that we have in the chat box is from Marcel. Can you say anything about beyond access to finance? So the continuation, diversification, and growth of finance as a business expands. Um, I think I can uh, tackle this and then maybe Diana can also come in uh, from her experience working with, uh, with uh, SMBs. I, th I think beyond access to finance, the conversations around uh, business advisory services are very critical. What we've seen is that, you know, businesses will, will, will uh, access financing. And then what, what does that mean? You have the money. If you don't have a proper marketing strategy, if you don't have a proper uh, sourcing uh, of raw materials uh, model that, that you know, helps you to, to, to be sustainable, the financing may actually not uh, impact the business in, in a way that it should have impacted. So, uh, and, and also, um, in terms of diversification, we've seen businesses in markets that are really that are really struggling to access hard currency, uh, having a need to diversify to either other products that can help them, you know, reach the regional market uh, and hard currency, or other businesses uh, opportunities still within the food sector. Uh, you know, like if you are doing maize flour milling. You can diversify to you know look at what are the opportunities in your market. Would doing uh, uh, animal feed processing also add value to your business? If you're you know doing data processing, uh, what are the other opportunities that you can do? How do you even also diversify into other products that you're not dealing with? Probably from your byproduct. So, so these conversations need to keep uh, you know happening with SMEs. But the important thing is to look at the market need that is being addressed by this, you know, if you're to diversify into another opportunity. Uh, and, and in terms of growth, uh, what we uh, learned is that most of the SMEs will not have a uh, like a tracker, how do I track if I am growing at the right pace? Uh, what support do I need to do that? And working with them, asking them these questions, then is able to also put them in the right uh, track in terms of how do I make sure that my growth, first of all, is sustainable and I'm actually growing at a, at a comfortable pace. Um, I don't know if Diana has something to add to that. Uh, just very little, Beatrice. And it's just to say that um, beyond access to finance, um, what happens is the business model tends to change. And I think that's one thing we, we know, but don't tend to appreciate in terms of the impact it has. So as you continue to develop more capacity in uh, value creation or processing a, along various product lines, then there are very many things that change. One, the nature of the competition you were working with before is not the same that you are in, in the current market. And sometimes if a business does not plan for it, you find that whereas you are coming from a position of strength previously, you're coming into a level where you're like uh, uh, one of the lower rank players. So I think it's always something that businesses need to really think about. On diversification, um, I just wanted to say sometimes when the business is growing, you tend to grow based on the original line that you had. And yet when the new opportunities come, I always say they're like hungry children, you know, whereas you want, you had one child, well-fed, you know, resources were available. Every time you innovate, you have other people you're adding into that line. So sometimes what happens is if entrepreneurs don't plan their cash flows well or their cash allocation well, they tend to starve the business that is growing and sustaining them in the name of fueling this new innovation or new product lines. So we always say that the business always has to plan some in some way or form, some way of funding, especially new products, new diversification. Because sometimes, even with funders, if you're going into a new business line, there's a business risk attached to it. Even if it's the same uh, version of the product, it could be a new sub-market, it could be a new channel of distribution. So there's a new element of risk that you're putting to it. And what funders will always want to know is, is it only my money that is funding the risky venture? Or are you also putting something along? Yeah, where is your skin in the game? So we always advocate for as a business grows, put aside some funding to fund your pilots. 
right? Or to fund your diversification because you need to reach certain milestones for funders to feel you've de-risked this efficiently enough for me to be able to come in and walk along the journey with you. And if you have sufficient skin in the game, we are able to ensure that each party bears a portion of that particular risk. Yeah. Great, thank you both for sharing your insights um, for this question. And we'll conclude with one final question in the Q&A. And this one is from Wei Ting. Um, among all processed food value chains, is there any value chains you have a particular focus on? Besides, what are the proportion of different value chains, food, vegetable, fishery, et cetera, in general? And this is for the ANFP program as a whole. Um, uh, I don't know if Angela is. I, I, I can take this. So as a program, uh, we didn't have, we won't uh, have any focused uh, value chains. The program worked with processors of uh, nutritious foods, and this cut across a lot of value chains. But on access to finance, what we, we noticed is that, you know, the more uh, value chain is structured in a specific market, the easier it was for it to access financing. Uh, for other value chains, like, uh, the others I mentioned, aquaculture, groundnuts, honey, the conversations were harder because, first of all, there is uh, limited data available in the market. Uh, number two, you know, even the, the clients who are in those value chains are quite small. They, they, they're not very, very well uh, well established and they're not at the, the growth stage to attract a lot of financing and to also share their learnings on these value chains. Um, I, I want to pause there and see if Angela want to add something to it on the value chain of focus. If not, uh, over to you, Vivian. Okay, I think Angela might have dropped, but um, we also are at the top of our hour. And thank you, Beatrice, for answering, answering that question. Our report also dives a little bit deeper into that, which will be sent out in a follow-up email um, after this webinar is over. So I just want to wrap up this session and thank all of our panelists and attendees for all of your invaluable insights and also for your active participation and congratulate our food processors on the panel for their success also in this program. So thank you all for being a part of today's webinar um, where we really explored the role of access to finance and really beyond just that um, in supporting SMEs in the food processing industry. We've had and heard insights and experiences from different experts. We've delved into the challenges, also the solutions, and also disc um, and discussed you know, actionable strategies and things to do going forward to empower more SMEs. So um, we hope that the knowledge today that was shared can be carried forward uh, for future programs. And I would like to thank you all for joining and we look forward to connecting again soon. So thank you all for your time and goodbye.